Okay. I guess we're all here. It's past time, 6.33, so I'd like to call the hearing to order, so to speak. Recording in progress. Yes, the hearing. Okay, let me, let me say it again. Let's open the hearing. It's 6.34. Uh, so this is a hearing about the proposed town garage, and we're all here to answer questions and give information to the general public. Um, we've got the architect that just walked in. We've got some questions and answers, and I see Andy's here. So um, here is, we go. There is printed material if people want to. Yeah, we have chairs. some material uh, around on the chairs, or right there on the chair, right there. Yeah. And a sign-in sheet. Please sign in for the minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't have any, so. Okay. Okay. okay, so uh, once you get the sign-in sheet done and information in your hands, we are ready to answer any questions or give any information anybody like. Yeah, we can do the presentation first. Yeah. Go for it. Do you have the floor plan? We have the picture of them right here. Does that help at all? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is David Roy with Weeman Lanfear Architects. Um, we're up in South Burlington. Um, it's hard to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's much better. So, uh, can everybody hear me now? Okay. Yes. I'll try and be speak up if I if you can't. My name's David Roy. I'm with Weeman Lanfear Architects. Um, we were hired to, to do some preliminary studies to evaluate options for the East Montpelier garage. Um, we've, we've been working with Guthrie and the prior town administrator as well to kind of go through those options and we've landed on this approach. Um, this is a 8,600 square foot, 8,700 square foot facility. Um, it houses, you're gonna house the grader, four 10 wheelers, a six wheeler, and then, oh, I'm sorry, the grader's here. This is the bucket loader. Uh, and then there's also room and space for equipment and uh, maintenance operations to occur. Uh, there's an office space, um, a, a bathroom and shower facilities, a break room that incorporates kind of a conference room space, and then mechanical space to support the building itself. Um, we are proposing a wood frame structure um, that has stem walls that come up a good distance so that they're protected from impact and water and moisture and all that, um, uh, but has a low embodied carbon, so that it's got a very small carbon footprint. Um, we're, 
We are proposing fire protection, which will allow them to keep a very open bay concept. Um, and uh, the fire protection also allows them to do maintenance operations and such within the building. Um, and these tanks can also serve as thermal storage for the heating and cooling of the building. Um, so we are proposing a geothermal heating system. Uh, it's, I'm not sure if anybody are familiar with that, but there's different systems that we can look at, both open loop and closed loop. I think we're looking at a closed loop system for this. Um, so there would be a number of geothermal wells that are out on the site that we would use to collect water and then re take heat or cool off the water and then reject it back into the ground. Um, trying to think. Um, the building itself from... From the street, um, right now their existing building is just beyond this one. It is, um, uh, it's hard to explain. It would be in front of this location. We have it structured so that all of the bay doors open to the north onto the yard so that you have good clear access and circulation uh, in. You would enter the site off to the right here uh, so you'd have good visibility from the office and administrative areas of the building of people coming into the yard. You'd have good visibility of the yard out in front. Um, all the water will shed off to the back to the south side of the building so that there's no icing or buildup of water and ice on the front or snow for that matter. Um, and then you can exit, also exit the site down this side um, near to where the old fire station is, uh, the fire station building. And um, this, there's also an exit on this side, on the east side for the grader to come out to exit the building as well. Dave, yep. could I just underline a point that you made? That, Absolutely. Uh, Tem Templeton Road is behind the building as we're looking at it from this view. That's right? correct. From here, Templeton Road runs right, right through behind the building, so you can't see it, but you'd access Templeton Road to the right here and go down a little bit. So, uh, so this, yep, this being Templeton Road, um, well, this, this, this is, is the side. office administrative yeah. area. So you're gonna enter the site, yep, enter the site from here, kind of the direction that they do enter it now. Um, but all of the yard equipment, um, Pile, sand piles, um, all the paraphernalia and stuff that the department uses is kind of out of sight behind the building a little bit. Um, we have a silo here for pellets. That is not, we're, we're not thinking about that direction. That was one option that we were looking at, but that's just an optional piece that uh, either we use or don't. Um, Good yeah. Where's the watch trail? It's on the right. It's on the right. So it's still beyond the sand park. Yeah. Still be able to still be able to park, still be able to get in. Yeah, it doesn't have any doesn't have any impact on that. Yeah. So just so you know, the current existing building, the, what the DPW operates out of right now, is right here, right in front of these doors. <clears throat> I'm thinking it's about 12 feet from the existing building that we start that these doors will be located. So the intent is to build the new building, let them use or occupy at least a portion of their existing building during construction, and then once this is complete and ready to go, we'll demo the old structure away. Uh, I, yeah. I, I have, I have, this is actually for Guthrie and for Seth. Um, do, do you want to give like a quick little synopsis of, this is all technical, this is great. Why do we need a new building? I mean. Why do we want to spend all of this money? And why is it so critical to the, the really the, the, the issue is not what the building is going to look like, but why do we want to, why do we need this? Is there anyone here who hasn't heard that more than 
Thomas. Or, or online. We, we, we have a TV camera going here. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone, no questions about the building itself. Yeah. And you can go back to it, but because we got critically, Dave is up here, so yeah, he'd like to answer the questions pertaining to the building first. Either yeah, way, yeah. either way, whatever. Yeah. Guthrie, do you want to speak to your current existing conditions? Uh, well, we are still very able to give, if we have to, another tour in the future. I know some of the folks here are able to meet and it's fairly self-explanatory when you step into the building that the building has run out of real estate internally. Yeah. It, it, it is tight to say the least, um, difficult to make your way to navigate to emergency exits, it, and that's still leaving half a million dollars worth of equipment outside almost year round. Yeah. And it was like that 10 years ago. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as it is now, but yes. And still not. I would like to comment on the building. Um, I was very skeptical about the need to um, tear down the old building. I thought we could reuse it, that it has a straight roof line and that the structure is sound and that it would be wasteful to knock it down. But I went there and walked around in the building and uh, from having been in the world of fixing things and rebuilding buildings, I can see that there is nothing there that's worth saving. And more than that, it's a health hazard just to be in that building. I'm a little sensitized to fumes because of my exposure over my life, but uh, after having been in there for just 10 minutes, I was feeling kind of ill. And um, I think it would be unfair to not provide our town employees with a better building. Amen. And uh, I don't see that there's any value in trying to save what's there, in my opinion. Yeah, that's our So, Guthrie, in addition to you said, just for another question. So, in addition to the physical and the half a million dollars in, in, in mechanical trucks, we we're talking just as you just mentioned the human factor, yep. which is attracting, keeping the well-being of the town employees. If you just want to make a couple of comments on there, there is going to be some new faces on the crew in the next three years. I would say uh, we have a couple guys that will be up for retirement, and they're that kind of the game plan. Is in the next three years we'll see at least two retire, uh, and this would be. It would be a nice way to start off not having new crew members where you're trying to train. The, the timing of it is going to be really nice. You're going to bring in a much much more valuable employee to the town also, which long-term effects for a while. You know, for the first 15, 20 years of it, that's something you say. You're in a fairly new garage at that point. So the attraction for the attraction for an employee will be there. It's kind of a hidden, hidden question. Yeah. Yeah, like this gentleman, I, I too was a skeptic until I went there and Guthrie gave us an amazing tour. Um, I hadn't realized the trucks were as big as they are. <laughs> and uh, I hadn't realized too that how you park a truck with the rear view mirrors overlapping and still get them out the next day. So um, yeah, I, I, I think I've lived in East Montpelier for almost 50 years. I was a near neighbor of the town garage. I never went in until this, this weekend. And it's an eye opener, and I would encourage others to, to do the same. Yeah. And there are people like me who went in it 10 years ago and were horrified. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about it. Maybe it's OK. But I was horrified then. And I'm so glad that I haven't I've been, Charles and I have been back and forth. It was really horrible. You should go see it. And um, it, it really, everyone should see that place. It's not a good place to work, I don't think. And when I make a phone call to, to the um, crew there or anybody that's working there, and I think of that call, I think the calls go into the garage, don't they? Yeah, yeah, right. I think of somebody receiving my call with usually a request for something in that place, and it just doesn't seem right, you know. I, 
I'm so glad that we're dealing with this. It's painful. It's a lot of money. And it's so necessary. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm a capital budget uh, chairman, as you know, and uh, this has been on our, the agenda for the town for 15 or 20 years at least, because this goes way back. People that are no longer in town, they're somewhere in North Carolina and <laughs> everywhere else that have been working on this pre guthrie even being here, you know, this was, this was under uh, review. Tommy's nodding his head because, you know, you, yeah, you're back. Yeah, this goes way back. This is a need that's been uh, put off and put off. And there's some reasons for that. We did the other facilities and schools and everything else that have hit. But I'm really glad that this has come up to be uh, to where it is. You know, we need, we need to deal with this. And the cost to benefit ratio on this is, is going to be big for the town. Uh, it's an asset to the town. It, it adds value to all of our properties by having good school systems, good facilities. Uh, we're a great town. We need to maintain uh, that. And great travels. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is there a lifespan on this that you could, I mean? I, I mean, depends on the systems that you're looking at. I mean, you're going to have to do some maintenance on the mechanical systems over the years, but you can you, you can get to 50 years out of this building. I mean, that's the anticipated life cycle that we typically foresee uh, is 40 to 50 years uh, is is the life cycle of the building. It's a 50 year depreciation on this building, yeah. is what it will be. Uh -huh. We should, none of us should have to deal with it ever again. <laughs> time, time, timeline, so if we hopefully approve this in November, is there, what would be the timeline when you think that it would be, would be that uh, Guthrie's crew would be able to move in, roughly? Yeah, I mean, we would work on it over the winter. We would do all the engineering. So we've, we've only gotten about 15% into the design work. Um, so architecturally, we'd pull our structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers all together, along with our civil engineer, and work on that through the winter. Um, we'd have to do soil boring analysis and such uh, for the structural. Um, and we'd be prepared to put it out to bid in the spring of 2025. Uh, should that be your choice? And it, that seems like well, a yeah. practical. Like yeah, that's, yeah, that's our goal. Uh, and then I would anticipate a project of this scope would probably take about eight months to construct. So you'd be looking at probably January or so of the following year, of 26, nice. being kind of the time that you move in. Uh, that's rough, but... Um, and that kind of timeline would you get closed in by winter? I'd like to, yeah, absolutely. We could have the villa shell all complete, and yeah, we could do all the finishes inside, and even though it's a little colder out. Well, there are problems, I understand, I hear from others that there are problems getting contractors. Will the size of this project make it more first in line kind of thing? Yeah, um, this is a good size project, so we could get a number. I mean, our goal would be to get five or six contractors bidding on this project, and that's, that's not unreasonable. That's what I'd like to see anyway. Um, And just, just, just um, further information, we have hired um, a firm, some individuals, that will be looking after our best interests. So we, they would hire the general contractor. They would make sure that the, the costs were, were in line, competitive, proper, making sure that everything was, was done the way it should be, um, almost like a, a, a GC on our side rather than say, Okay, here's the project, build it, and you know, that maybe the, and they would be on our side um, from a quality and a cost perspective, and it might come in even less than, um, than allocated. So we're really concerned about getting a, getting a team, I think there's two individuals, that are in our camp. Um, you know, it's like if it was my house, I'm gonna be looking at, looking at this, you know, on, on our behalf. So there is some, some comfort that we are being treated properly from those two perspectives. I have another question about um, potential for uh, harm. Um, 
working in a site that's being built has its hazards, and I'm thinking of respiratory hazards. Mm -hmm. Is there some way, we're expending a lot of money, and we're investing in the well-being of the town. We haven't spent it yet. And, yeah, we haven't spent it yet. <laughs> and the well-being of the people who work there. So is there some way that we can spend an extra tenth of 1% <coughs> and have really good air filtration and air quality control while people are working in the building? That's oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's part of That the is thing. absolutely part and of this. And you can yeah. speak that a little bit. I mean, the, the building's going to be so efficient, you'll be able to exchange air really, really well. I think, see, are you talking, I'm talking, talking about, about during, during the building? During construction. Oh, during construction. During construction. So typically, working in oh, a construction. So that's, the road crew is not there. They're not going to be working with the building. I just heard someone say that you'd have them in there and you could work around. No, they're going to be in the building. building. Yeah. No, oh. Yeah. The road crew is not going to be in there until they're not there. Okay, Great sorry. Job. Take it back. Yeah, don't they're, they're, they're not in the yeah. building anymore. Anyway. But there's, you know, I also, thought they were going to be working in a build, a site that was being built around. Not until January 26th. That question also applies to the people who are doing the construction work. Mm -hmm. And generally what we require is what's called an indoor air quality management program during construction. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a certain amount of ventilation when certain things are going on. There has to be heat not from a salamander that's dumping exhaust into the space, but uh, you know, uh, a temporary heat um, that if it's, if it's burning something, it's, it's uh, like propane, it's, uh, the exhaust is outdoors. So there's, there's a whole section of the specifications that the contractors have to abide by to keep the air quality good for your construction. Yeah. Thanks. Andy, at the open house or the tour there, you gave a great interesting talk about the energy system that would be used. And maybe briefly tell the folks about that, because I, yeah. I was fascinated by that. So, as I was telling Edie, uh, in a moment of weakness, I signed up for the town energy committee. And, um, you know, part of the deal is to do the energy plan for the town, but then this project came up, and that's sort of more of my wheelhouse. My, my work is in, in high performance building design. And, um, you know, generally, you know, town might go out and say, well, just give me a butler building, a prefab steel building with a propane boiler and call it good. So I said, what if we looked at some alternatives for that? And, and you all, immediately said, yeah, go ahead, take a look. So um, I did a, an analysis of the energy, and um, Dave's office did an analysis of cost for both uh, a steel building and a high-efficiency wood building. And, um, and then in the wood building, I did an analysis of we could fire it with propane, wood pellets, uh, an air source heat pump, or a ground source heat pump. And um, to me back up one second on that, the engineer that we're working with, the mechanical engineer, has done a bunch of garages for AOT for the you know, state. And um, what they do is they put radiant floors in it. And it's really good for this kind of application because of the trucks come in, you're bringing in, I don't know, how many tens of thousands of pounds of truck, but you're also bringing in a lot, a lot of water, a lot of ice, and, you have, and the trucks need to be warm so that when that snowstorm happens, they can go out again and they got to get dried out so you can put sand in them and it's not all frozen in the back. Um, so there's a big heat load there and when you heat that from below with that slab, it melts off and it evaporates and there's a ventilation system to take out the moisture. Um, and um, so the radiant slab can be heated, you can heat it with a boiler um, and it, it's a really good application for heat pumps because you only need like 100 degree water in that floor. And a heat pump can make 100 degree water very efficient. And a ground source can make it even more efficiently than an air source. Um, so I did the analysis and looked at what was the load of the building every hour of the year for some typical weather year. And then looked at the efficiency of all these different options in order to come down to how much energy it's going to take and what's going to cost to operate. And um, then the engineers did uh, a life cycle cost analysis, looking at the initial cost, the maintenance cost, you know, like mechanical systems, you think 15, 20 years, they're, they're being replaced, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and um, for it, they did it over a 30 year period, and uh, turned out the ground source and the air source heat pumps had the lowest um, life cycle cost of any of the options, including the cheaper building. 
the, well, it turned out the steel building wasn't all that much cheaper right. in the end. Right. And there was a professional cost estimating company that, that did all the cost estimates. And um, on top of that, the feds are now, with the IRA, they're paying 40% of the cost of doing the ground source heat pump system, which in this case amounts to something like, I can't remember exactly, it's in the $150,000 yeah. neighborhood. And it used to be, you know, that the, the energy credits were all tax credits, and if you didn't pay tax, you couldn't do anything with it. But the IRA changed that, and now nonprofits and municipalities can actually just get a check for that um, incentive. So with that plugged in, the ground source heat pump system has the lowest cost, and it's also the lowest operating cost. Plus, um, if it runs on electricity, that's something we know how to make with the sun. Yeah. And we can put an array on the roof there, and the cost of that electricity from that system, if you take the cost to buy the system and look at its total lifetime kilowatt hours, it's about 10 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and on a commercial rate for Washington Electric, it can be anywhere from 15 to 25 cents, depending on the demand charges. Um, so it's paying all your energy cost up front at a lower rate than you'd ever be able to pay it otherwise. So particularly when you're bonding and you get a, you get a relatively low interest rate for that, it's, it's really a, a pretty, good, pretty good deal. So Andy, will you describe, the, the costs include that. Yeah, will you describe, Charles told me something that I thought was really cool about it too, which is the positive air pressure that a, a floor, such a floor, creates in the building. Because you've got a building with bay doors that are opening all the time. So the loss of air, can you describe that wonderful part of it? So the typical way in the old, old fashioned buildings um, is they'll put in a loading, which is a big fan coil unit. Uh, and uh, they would put, they'd be like 100,000 BTU an hour. I mean, this is like a giant furnace. And there'd be a couple of them. So that when you open all the doors in the morning and you completely change that 60 degree air for minus 20 degree air or minus 10 degree air, it's a big load. But with the radiant floor, what happens is that whole floor surface is now heating that air. And so you don't have to have those things. Um, there might be some radiant heat uh, on the ceiling right by the garage doors, but... Um, it keeps the cold air from coming in. No, no. cold air will come it, it, it just helps it recover a little more quickly. Yeah. But you've got so much mass. If, if the slab is running at 100 degrees or 105 degrees, you've got so much thermal mass built yeah. up in that that you can recover the air temperature really, really quickly. Yeah. And the, the boreholes that go into the ground, if they're closed loop, they're 500 foot drill hole and there's a U-tube piping that goes in there and then it's filled with a, a grout that's thermally conductive that conducts the heat and it's essentially it's a big ground heat exchanger and probably be eight of those and you circulate water through those and that water when you first turn the thing on in the fall comes up like ground temperature which is just below 50 degrees here somewhere between 45 and 50 and then as and then so those heat pumps work very efficiently off of that uh, as you go farther into the winter, it could get all the way down to near freezing, that water that's coming through. So it's actually a black hole in that loop. And, um, but it's still way better than trying to, well, than extracting heat out, out of the air, which is like the air source heat pumps. You know, the typical ones you're seeing now, the mini splits and all. They work down to, down to 20 below, but they got to work a lot harder to get air, heat out of, you know, zero degree air than out of 30 or 40 or 50 degree air. So doesn't the it's, glycol get kind of stiff after a while? What's after, that? after about 25 years, doesn't the glycol begin to get stiff? You will have to replace you, you it. Yeah. Now and again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question about the, uh, Dave, I think it was you who mentioned that the fire suppression water storage in there could also be used for thermal storage. That, that's exactly it, right. Is yeah. that, would that the idea be that you'd have 100 degree water in there during the winters so yeah. that maybe the solar panels could be heating up during the day and, and getting a bunch of water to be hot for use during the night? You would, well, on an economic basis, you would um, save that store heat for, um, to lower your peak demand. Yeah. So when, when it's really cold out, you'd be relying on those tanks more and the heat pumps less, so you wouldn't get big demand charges on the electric side. Yeah, and it cuts off the demand on the, on the pumps, on the geothermal pumps, um, if you can utilize that tank instead of for a short period of time. Yep. And uh, generally, those, those heat pumps need a buffer tank anyhow. Yeah. 
And so we've got a built-in buffer tank, so we've already bought the tanks. Yeah, we're going to get two for on yeah. all this, hopefully. And 100 degree water will put out a fire just like 70 degree water. So. <laughs> Once that mass is heated up, it will hold the heat for, you know, literally it takes very little to heat that floor once it's, you brought it up to the temperature. It That's will exactly maintain right. its heat with very little uh, activity. Yep. Yeah. And the idea is that you set it and forget it. You don't ever yeah. come back. You don't try and adjust yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, if I lose power, I have a generator, but if I don't put the generator on or something, I, my floor will stay a 200 year old house and a new addition. The new addition floor, which we, I put a radiant in, was, will last for days. Yes. It will still be warm, like three three days in the middle of the winter, you know, before mm -hmm. it loses all the heat. So it's a very good system. And Geo is even better than being a regular. I would like to expand on Carl's comment. What you were referring to is geo, um, not geothermal, uh, solar thermal. And before we had efficient and inexpensive solar panels, photovoltaics, everybody used solar thermal because it was affordable. Yeah. And it was displaced when Photovoltaics became inexpensive, and uh, heat pumps became the flavor of the week. And that's where we are right now. And my crystal ball says in 20 or 30 years, we'll be looking at solar thermal again because of the high value it offers and the simplicity and the longevity of a solar thermal system where there's very few moving parts and none of them are expensive, uh, is going to become attractive. But right now, if you start to talk about it, everybody sort of moves away from you like you're too weird. <laughs> um, but I've enjoyed the whole summer without having to burn anything with my antiquated solar thermal system. Yeah. And so the problem with it is that if the sun isn't out, like it turned cloudy, now I've got to burn something. And the heat pumps are right there, ready to go all the time. So they sort of made the solar thermal too hard to use. Oh, I was actually moving away from you like you were we out. I was, I was talking about solar electric using uh, to, to heat the water in there. But oh, solar well, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I so think it's... I'll pull that. I got it. I'll pull back from the weeds because we can get into detail and spend the entire evening here. Um, the, the other question that we've that, that is in your packet here is if if this is passed, should we be looking at a 20 or a 30 year um, schedule for the bond that we would have to? One <clears throat> Well, well, Conversation, no decision has been made. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, the interest accruing is substantially different, um, and you really don't want to be paying more interest. It, it adds so much to the overall cost. Because you're paying both principal and interest. On and the interest rate will be lower. The interest is going to be substantially lower I mean, over 20 years. Not made yet, but just to talk about the bigger picture of what we're talking about here instead of the temperature of hot water, which is important, but. Most people are, you know, it, it's a cost. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty hard to read. No. Yeah. I would give you this. Have we paid off the four nation? No. no. It's got about a million years. Right. Right. Is it a point 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 year? It was 20. 20 years. Yeah. So we're around 10 or 11 years into it. And that payment is 100 and something a year. Chad's around 140, so that's about, it's about four and a half cents on the tax rate, the one that we have for the fire department. So once that goes away, that's going to soften the blow of this quite a lot. So 10, it's 11 cents on the tax rate for the 20 year, approximately. I have a question on this. So it looks like for $100,000 of house value on 20 years, it's about $110. Yeah. Highest impact because it what it, right. it goes down over time. What's that? Yeah, if the payments go down over time, is that what it is? Right down there. Kind of way up, right? But I gotta gotta read that uh, payment schedule on the back. No, the, yeah. I, mean, I mean normally the principal goes down. Yeah, right. The, the, the payment the, usually stays the same. The payment stays the, the same. You're just stays. paying off your like if a board, if you have a mortgage. What does this say? You're paying on the more back? in the principal. 
It's usually the same, I thought, but. It's always the same. No, if you look at the, um, you, you look at the first column, principal, we're paying 200. Yeah, I'm looking uh, at the first So if you look at the first column. 247, yeah. Right, 247. It's the same payment. 247, 247,000 dollars a year. It's the same payment, payment. it's just more principal, principal. As, as you go into the, 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 it. The yearly payment will be the same every single year. It's just whether it's a 20 or a 30 year payout. You see that, you see this? The, the year, the year payment is 247, and this is whatever, 187 or something. Right. So every year is going to be the same. It's just like when you buy a house, you pay more principal, and by the time you get to the end of 30 years, you're paying zero principal and just interest. Same as a mortgage. Every year will be the same. This, this is irrelevant. Both of these are irrelevant, principal versus interest, because we're a nonprofit, so we're not writing off any interest anyway. It's, it's really just the first. It's just the first column is what to be concerned of. So, so it says, so I, I don't think that's the way it works right now. Well, that's what he was asking for. I believe that that way. Is for the highest cost of the building. So we have, Ed, Ed could you please wait? So we have a, a cost of maybe $5.1 million, but as we talked about, it can come on uh, less than that. So the way I'm reading it is highest impact annually is that if it comes in at 5.1. Does, so does that make sense? sense? So Scott, you look at that last column, and the yeah, payments look like it go down. Yeah, it goes down. It does go down. This is the last bond, column, and the payments go down. No, here's the column. This is what you're paying. No, this is principal. You're paying yeah, the same principal. No, the bonds, the bonds. Yeah. You're, you're paying that in principal. It gets recalibrated. There's less interest each each year. Yeah, and the payment goes down. And the payment yeah. goes down each year on the yeah, bonds. I, I, yeah. I'm not familiar with. It. No, I'm not. But it's, it's, well, you're talking, yeah, actually, what you said is true uh, to a regular mortgage. It's, you, know, you, you do your amortization. Right. So, but this is right. the first year three forty-seven. Yeah. And then the last year it'll be two fifty. It's, it's different, and in, in the interest is less. It goes up for the first two years, and then it goes down after that. Yeah, I, I can't read it this way. What am I reading last? Could this be reduced? You got to put it on the street. I got the yeah, we'll, 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 put it on the street and put it in a blower. So, so highest it would be would be eleven cents. Okay. Which would be a hundred and ten dollars on a hundred thousand dollars worth of value. So if you're paying, you know, both sorts of houses that are five hundred thousand, so I multiply that times five, so that's going to be five hundred fifty bucks. Added taxes on a half a million dollar house. And what happens? If, is it the same rate for non-residential property? No, that, that comes at a higher rate, right? Non-res is less. It's less. Right now, it's less. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yes, yeah, less. There's a bill in the legislature that may change that. <laughs> it's every town is different, though. I believe, but but anyway, that's the way it is. Most of us are, have to pay the homestead rate. That's what you're going to pay. Uh, I'm thinking about businesses and, you know, like we're going to house we rent out, so that we pay full freight on. On your residence? You no, know, the house we rent out. Oh, you do? Yeah. So you, you don't pay residential rate on that? It, uh, it's a higher rate, right? The, the, the education tax rate or something is higher on non residential Did you know that? Total that total 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 residential property. The total tax is total. The non the, it, it depends on the town. And I know. The rate. Yeah, uh, we were one of the first, I think, that went into the, the reverse. But yeah, it was 37 towns a couple of years back. And anyway. I think it's over half the towns in the state pay for we'll, we'll as residents. Big, big no, print and and no, that's actually, obviously it'll be obviously it'll be more expensive upfront uh, per year for 20 versus 30. But interest rates will be low, a little bit lower. I was just going to say, in print, so interest difference over the 20 Definitely. Over, the overall cost. I yeah, do. Yeah, you got to look at over okay. and, and it's not going to buffer it that much, but this becomes a capital budget item. One of the reasons I'm, I'm here is to feel for it. Yeah. We did put a little bit of money towards that building into the capital budget just as a thing. So yeah. we already have. There's some flexibility in that budget. It's a work, it's a living document. So we've been putting money for the emergency building away for a number of years and we haven't used it. So theoretically, when we, when we get this in, we could shift a little bit here and there around to buffer the increase. Not a lot, not, not you know, for numbers like this, it's not gonna, you're gonna be a big bond. But the actual impact may be a little bit less because we've already got like maybe 
10,000, 20,000 a yeah. year in the capital budget right. that we can move yeah. to this project specifically. You go take, take 10 from that, that building there and maybe take five from the municipal building and move it over. The opportunity fund take you know years of that yeah. and move it over and then that will lower everything and grab and that will which is what the whole point of the capital budget is is to yeah. buffer these type of things plus not the, not a lot but plus the fire department will end yes about 10 years and what, what's the budget on this school do you anybody know offhand what we're paying for it? no no we don't know we we're not privy to the school I mean, we don't go to school meetings. We don't go to school meetings. You do. Yeah, because it was yeah, after the, yeah. 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 yeah, it was a maturity date. Anybody know off the top it of it? It says in here, 2030. Oh. I read it someplace. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, any questions about the theory, the ideas, um, thoughts? I mean, you guys are interested. Thank you for coming. But we're just, there'll be two more meetings. We might even schedule a garage. I mean, I, I was out of state. I'd like to see the garage too, but. Um, to the end. Yeah. That way we don't have to gear up for snow again in August like we did this past week. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, any thoughts? Any fee any any feedback? We didn't get that. We had all the plow here on all the uh, trucks. Um, I would so like to comment on the building. Uh, yeah. We seem to have been working our yeah. way around. <laughs> we haven't talked about the building at all. Thank you. Is this well, the right thing? We haven't talked about the building? No. Well, we had the whole early. Oh, you came in, you came in a little late. No. The beginning of the meeting, we were talking about the building. Do you want to ask a question about the building? What do you want to ask about the building, Stephen? Um, I want to make a comment about what I'm seeing. Yeah. Okay. I see that we're building the wrong building in the wrong location. Okay. And that the design of the building and the location were altered and driven by the solar panels on the roof. Isn't that correct? Yes. This, well, there's a combination of factors. The, the building was moved yes. from the obvious location on the back side of the lot facing south yep. to the road so that the solar panels could be on the roof. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think we should be uh, um, looking at the building as a solar panel supporting structure. Now, Andy's <coughs> explained to me that this is the least expensive way to put solar panels up, but if it affects the location and the configuration of the structure, then I have to ask, are we still getting the best thing that we can get for our money? And or are we compromising some of the physical benefits that we could be having from the building in order to have solar panels on the roof. Now, solar panels were originally put on roofs because they were making hot water and you want the heat close to the water heater. And they weren't very big. And then we went to photovoltaics and everybody said, oh, solar panels go on the roof because that's where they've always been. And this is just like uh, a continuation of that mindset and I feel strongly that solar panels should be out in a field somewhere not on a roof of a building and that frees you up to build the building that you want to build and you don't have to get bogged down by worrying about the roof pitched and the location of the building to accommodate that and so it, so it, yeah no, that's fine that, that's, I understand where you're coming from we built the building on a part of the site that is not utilized as yard space, basically. So this, this option, by, by its location, by nature of its location, doesn't limit his mobility and access around the site as much. He's got more flexibility where to put his sand piles, where to put other equipment outside the yard, um, and then this, this building actually occupies kind of a slightly sloped area of the site that would otherwise be unutilized. And it also screens 
the, the rest of the backyard from the road and other things. So, yeah. Also, land is valuable. Yeah. And uh, arable land is particularly valuable. We have a lot of land. We don't have a lot of land. Actually, we, we, I don't want to have an argument about I mean, that. But we have, the, a, we ha we're pressed. I, I would like to ask a question. Could you uh, tell us how much energy the solar panels are going to generate in relation to how much the building is going to use? I would just do, like do to make the point that I don't think everyone would agree with your assessment that the panels are better in a field. I know there's an argument about placement of buildings and the, the history of solar panels. I okay, had a house yes. with them, but I don't think you have a that it naturally falls. Well, no, I mean, it's okay to oppose it. Um, yeah. If we can put the, build, the solar panels on a roof at a place where actually there's, there's a feed, an electrical feed coming into the building, then that's more efficient because you've got the transmission in and out of the building at the location of the, of the solar. Mm -hmm. It's that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of minor. Yeah, the, okay, the size of the array is only a fraction. This, the size of the array is sized to produce the amount of energy the building would use over a year. Yeah. Uh, to off, you know, produce that same amount of energy. It's a fraction of the roof. I don't know what it is, but it's a small piece of the roof. Oh, so it's just size for what we need. Yeah. 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 So the, also, like what Dave was saying with the salt shed isn't in that diagram, but the existing salt shed will stay. Yeah. And creating that screen in one location in and out, it'll be a lot easier to monitor who and what is coming in and out of the yard. Because right now you can go all the way around the building, you can go around the backside of a pile behind the building, you can go out behind the firehouse, you can come out towards the yeah. county road. Yeah. It's just really good. To, to utilize one spot in and out, it does become a spot where you can monitor much more efficiently. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And screening from what's back there. A lot of the state garages, that's what you'll see that they're doing now. Yeah. They place the building so it blocks the whole yard. You can't even see yeah. what's behind the building. Right. Carl? Yeah. So just to simplify this question, if there were no solar panels involved in this building, whether in a field or on a roof, then right. where, where on this site would you want the building to be located? You would have still located it there. Well, we had two options that we located. This is the one we landed on. Right. But. So if, much like you're saying, the very first option that we thought would be a good idea yeah. was laying the other way. Right. But then we ran out of real estate. The same thing. It was yeah. the access points didn't really work perfectly. Yeah. I feel like this really opens up a lot of yards. It was oh, more about right. circulation in the yard than actually the building itself. Yeah. It was more what was left over. Yeah. 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 I mean, I helped. I was the one that started putting the building the other way, but yeah. then when you came up with this design, I'm like, oh, that works. Yeah. You know, it's a good idea. We all have ideas, and some are better than others. <laughs> okay, this is good. Thank you, you guys. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate your um, tolerating my outrageous. <laughs> it's all good. Well, that's fine. Yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, it's helpful. It's helpful. yeah. 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 and thought provoking questions. So, um, if no, what's that? I would like to also say that um, I think we do need to put solar panels out in the field if we're really going to do something big and try to um, make a difference. And a little few solar panels that we're putting on that will help, but let's not get carried away with thinking we're saving enough. That I don't think that, they, that, that it's not a large enough area for the sun to shine on to heat that building. It's not? I'm pretty sure. It's I thought Andy said it was going to be We're not trying to heat it. With this it's about 50 kilowatts. Yeah. So it's not that big an array. It's, okay. it's just running the pumps. I mean, it's the pumps right. will run a lot. Around, but and a lot of pumping. Yeah, a lot of pumping. But it's so those you, solar panels serve that. And so it's not as important to your assessment. There are enough solar panels for this building. It's sized uh, according to our needs. Yeah. yeah. What do you say? So anyway, yes. Can I just say something of a playful nature? Sure. Um, and after that, we'll probably it relates to, to move Jen's, to meeting. <laughs> Jen's posting in the uh, front porch forum, which I, I think most of us have read. And it, yeah. We, we, got, we got kind of a chuckle out of it. And then I said, well, this raises another, another issue. And I, I wonder if I might uh, just read some, read some of the um, pieces that jumped out at me. And I'm not doing this to offend anybody. I just, it's, it's, it's in a good, good spirit. Um, she says, this dilapidated relic has seen better days. In fact, if this garage were much older, 
it would be eligible for Social Security. Um, I've been on Social Security for 20 years. <laughs> um, so I'm a, I'm a dilapidated relic, I admit. Um, uh, in the, there's a garage that looks like it survived a tornado. And this is, it's good, it's humorous. Uh, the roof is like a sagging old man after Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and a door creaks louder than Aunt Edna's knees when she tries to dance at the family reunions. So I was coming away with the idea that us older folks are ready to be, go where this garage is going to go, right? Out, out to pasture, or so on. And then I thought, well, how many people in, the, how many residents of East Montpelier are over 65 and will be paying for this structure? So you better not put us out to pasture too soon. <laughs> or we won't have the money to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we do have a regular meeting scheduled for tonight. So unless there's more questions, and we're more than happy to answer them, we'd like to shut the hearing off for tonight. We have two more, as Scott said, and that's the 11th and what was the other one? Uh, September 11th. Is going for vote next that time meeting? No, November 5th. Oh, November 5th. Since the it's because we timed it with the election, you know, we, presidential we, we, election. We figured there would be it's a presidential election, and this way it would allow them to work on all the art, all the drawings and everything over the winter to break ground. Otherwise, we're now putting it off another three or four or five months. So this we're, we're shooting for the November. It's, a, it's an ambitious schedule, but, you know, costs keep going up, so we kind of want to nail it down as quickly as we could. Ambitious schedule's been about a 20-year schedule here. <laughs> no, but once we pull the trigger, yeah, uh, first uh, I mean, the getting to the zone, I know that. It's schedule. not like you're rushing through this. This has been around for No, no, we're not rushing through it. It's, it's still, you know, we're, we're not sitting around on the design. Yeah, it's it's right. quite active. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions? Sounds good. But you, and if you have any questions, just send them to. This is one of the few meetings where the select board outnumbered, almost outnumbered. Yeah. <laughs> now that is distressing because I advocated to have the meeting here because I figured there'd be an overflow for the municipal building. Yeah. Now we could have it in the municipal building or, or the fire. Or the. <laughs> we could have it. Be able to have and we tried to. Just we, don't. We, everybody got a postcard. Just, We've got seven yeah. people, including, well, there's seven including me and press. So there's really six people on, online right now. Mm -hmm. Actually, five, we'd, five. we'd like a lot more people to come because when it comes to a vote, there's probably going to be a lot of people voting. Right. And they really ought to know uh, what they're voting on. You know, how, how much more do you front porch forum and say this was an amazing educational event? And please come to the next one. Yes. Oh, please do. Present make the uh, financial numbers bigger so they can be read. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I would also encourage another another open house at the garage. Yeah. 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 We'll okay. probably do another one before the next yeah. before our next uh, hearing. Uh, or at least I before the October. I would think before the last year, the October one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, right. Maybe right. before the October one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. The select board meeting is going to be stimulating if you want to stick around. You guys good?